Welcome to Ever Beyond 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 On Wolf Spirit Radio, Ever Beyond Radio, and Tir Nassau in Ireland. Be prepared to leave your belief systems behind as we go beyond teachers, beyond gurus, beyond duality, ever beyond beyond. Please join us in the chat room at www.wolfspiritradio.com forward slash listen. You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. Good afternoon. No, stop. Stop. Sorry, I'm, I'm holding the station together with the sellotape and... Uh, or sticky tape and uh, and string this afternoon, um, mainly because I'm I'm halfway through installing the new KX Studio Linux and I'm I've not finished yet. And by the time I get to my next shift, uh, if I can get some uh, studio downtime, I'll be able to swap the machines in and out and uh, and have uh, a new Ubuntu uh, Linux broadcaster. Nobody knows exactly what I just said, apart from some. Um, uh, about three people, perhaps, out of all the listeners. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but that's the state of play and, and why I keep on overrunning the, uh, the, the tracks and they don't just stop and the voice comes back in like they used to normally do. It will happen when I get the whole thing, uh, set back up. Uh, but I've got a lot to, uh, lot to fix up before that. Anyway, that's very boring, boring maintenance stuff because I've got a really interesting guest today. Um, we, we, you know, he's, he's been sending me some stuff on cha- uh, Facebook for the last few months and, uh, I thought, right, it's time. Now it is time, uh, to speak to Michael Graham. So, um, really without very much further ado, uh, let, cause we've, we've not, you know, we're, we're really jazzing. This is, this is jazz radio. Uh, we've, we, we don't, we've not spoken, uh, apart from chatted. Um, so, uh, I don't even know what your voice sounds like, <laughs> just a little bit. So, uh, good afternoon, and uh, where where are you speaking from today, Michael? Hi, Jiffy. I'm uh, good afternoon to you. Actually, it's evening time right now. Um, I'm speaking from uh, New Jersey, in the United States. New Jersey, indeed. Yeah. Yes, we have uh, our, our our favorite moderator is uh, is from New Jersey. Um, uh, her name is Vanessa, and. Uh, She's in the chat room herding the cats who are our listeners. They're all cool cats because this is jazz. <laughs> it's like I was at a party the other day and I was, um, there was, there was musicians playing and there was a, there was a beagle and, uh, the beagle was just kind of going, rrr, 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 rrr. and, um, yeah, for quite a long, long time I've been, um, playing guitar and, and listening to the beagles and playing along. And I, I realized that that's what blues is. Is, is people talking to their dogs with their guitar? Yeah, well, blues is sort of like a well. Some people have said blues is like the uh, black man's country. Mm-hmm. Uh, losing your dog and your girlfriend, and yeah, generally being sad and somehow being happy about it. <laughs> being yeah, it's the blues, and that's just the way things are. So anyway, from uh, well, we have more spectrums than blue, but. Uh, we, you know, I, I do like blue myself and, and, uh, so, uh, where, sh- where should we start? I mean, you started talking, um, a long time ago, uh, connecting in with the Andronicus material, um, which I, you know, I have to say it's, it's two hours out of, hmm, I can't remember, like 16 hours of broadcast that I do a week. Uh, so it's just one thing after another, after another for me, you know, some people go and they listen to one show and they listen to the next episode of that show but for me it's just like two hours out of out of the week and i'm just onto something else and and then i got uh sean's show and then all these other things and by the time the a- evening's finished i've kind of forgotten what went on during the show uh you know so much happens so um so people are actually listening to the thing on the other side of that um and also you know i'm i'm focusing on like what does this voice sound like uh you know, am I, am, are my levels correct? You know, all these, all these things. So, um, so from your perspective, 
what was what was your experience of it? How did how did you find this um, this <laughs> this strange little thing? I don't even know what to call the Andronicus transmissions. It's the strangest thing. Um, it, it's um, for me. Uh, I, I haven't uh, followed up on the latest um, episodes, but I I started off. Um, being drawn to it because of the mention of uh, Andronicus, well, specifically the, the Andromeda beings, and eventually got into some uh, material about Apollo, which is one of my uh, uh, favorite uh, characters to research. Um, but it, it, it started off as this amazing sort of uh, ad lib thing that you would do, and then it evolved into... <sighs> I, I, I don't say this in a negative sense, but it sounds like an amazing soap opera, like a radio show. And I, I thought it was pretty enjoyable. I also found some pretty interesting synchronicities about the, uh, the information that was being brought forth. Um, how some of the, the, the material that, um, uh, was discussed, um, could be corroborated with some of the mythologies that I've been familiar with. Um, and that's sort of what got me interested in listening a little bit further. But, but, Realistically, JP, originally I started listening to you through the Simon Parks material um, and a number of other shows. So it goes a little further back than Andronicus. All oh, right, excellent. So, so I was glad you kind of you kind of stumbled into the Andronicus world. Uh, uh, and again, you know, he is, he was. I mean, he's he's like many things. He's like he's almost like the the whole human evolutionary path in some ways, uh, and. I, I call these these guys uh, archetypal beings. Um, the, then they kind of they exist on a different different level to us in terms of our our consciousness. It's like thousands of us constitute one of them, or something like that. You know, like a collective being, different well, uh, yeah, meta I, level is what I'm trying to say. I think. Um, yeah. And yeah. and yet they have a personality and a character. That's what's fascinating. They do. It's it's very. I mean, they, you know, typical archetypical beings are are like that. They they represent uh, sort of an abstract aspect of some would say divinity. Um, and then we embody as human beings different parts of these archetypes depending on what path we take. And you know, it's I live my life sort of via synchronicity. I get my my guides to the agreement is you know you guys sort of show me the way and I. Mm -hmm. I'll, you know, decide whether or not I want to go. And there are a number of synchronicities that led me to the Andronicus material. At the time, like I said, Apollo is one of the, one of the, the, the archetypes that I, that I follow up on. And in fact, one of the beings that I interact with in my own personal daily life. And I was at a point where I wanted to learn more about, um, concretely who Apollo was through history and in, in real life and so on and so forth. And, uh, I was led very quickly to the Andronicus material. Uh, and then there's a mention of Zeus and Prometheus. And another synchronicity is I believe right around the same time, I had just finished watching the movie Prometheus um, when I first started with Andronicus, which I think was about two and a half months ago, even though the material is, is much older than that. So it's a, a series of synchronistic events that, um, that cycled around and, and led me to it, which gave me the information I needed. And, uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So, uh, so cause here's my thing. Um, there's, there's this idea that there, there were these, um, uh, these Egyptian gods and then there's Sumerian gods and then there was the Roman gods and the Greek gods and they all got different names, but they all seem to have, you yeah, know, it's like a bunch of bikers who move from one place to another, really causing havoc. Um, they're big. You know, they're larger than humans and, uh, you know, they basically go out and take whatever humans that they want. And presumably the humans are very happy to be, uh, to be raped and abused by these, uh, well, maybe not, um, <laughs> by these archetypal beings. Uh, but they have a, um, a certain character. Um, and, uh, so, so have you, have you got the big table, Michael? You know, I'm waiting for someone to come up with the big table that says, okay, Zeus, right. Zeus is this fellow, this fellow, this fellow, this fellow, blah, 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 blah. and he represents this quality and this, uh, zodiacal archetype and this frequency and this color. Has anyone done that? I don't know if anyone has in fact done that. I've, I've 
Sort I'm putting out for it. Anybody's got one, please send it to me. Thank you very much. I would love to get it also because I, I've, you know, I've been on the seeker's path for a long time. Started off with um, early Christianity, as many people in the Western Hemisphere have, and um, got out of that and started looking at Egyptian, Greco-Roman, you know, African, Chinese, all these different uh, Hindu uh, philosophies and, and, and traditions, and um, I've started to notice certain patterns that exist between the different silos of religion. There is, um, if you're familiar with the, the African Yoruba tradition, which interestingly enough has very strong connection with the Norse uh, mythological story. Uh, Snorri Sor- Snorrelson and his, his poetic Eddas and the, the, the detailing of, say, Thor and Odin uh, as it's connected to Obatala of Yoruba tradition and, and uh, Shango, who is the, the double headed axe wielding thunder god, which is similar to the double headed so uh, half thing god of Thor. All right. Um, so um so Michael I would I yeah, so sorry, it's it's just the uh the accenting of it. So I would call them the Yoruba. Uh, are you talking about the Yoruba of uh, Nigeria? Correct. Uh huh. I did, yeah. I, you know I had no idea. I used to have a Yoruba girlfriend well usually girlfriend but uh, female friend. Um uh and uh they they were just running away from Biafra at the time, and it was like not much time to take their tradition. So that's fascinating that they had a a Norse um, a Norse god type tradition, or at least they're talking about the same characters but with different names. Yeah, indeed, exactly. And so I came to realize after time that you know these gods they live many thousands or millions of years, and they've been interacting with us for a long, long time. And as you go from culture to culture, as you say, biker gang style. Um, these different cultures interact with these gods in different ways and give them different names. And, you know, in, they, they, they may focus on one particular aspect of them, uh, as opposed to another. And so you find that there is a certain, there are certain sets of gods, um, that, or deities that, that are very similar across the board. You know, Egyptian, Roman, Greek, even the Hindu pantheon has certain gods that, that are connected. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I mean, for example, I like to look at, uh, you know, obviously, again, Apollo, who was both Osiris reincarnated as Horus and then, you know, became Apollo Apollyon in the Greek and the Roman tradition. And there's a there's an African Aplu who is very similar. And if you go even into the the um, the Hindu tradition, you start talking about uh, Apollo as as one of the, the distinct aspects of the god there known as Shiva. Uh, he has many aspects and one of them is a Rudra and, you know, or specifically Rudra and the characteristics are uncanny. In fact, there are many comparisons between the two. Oh. Um, okay. So let, let's just pause there, right? So there's, there's facts, factor number one, the O person, right? Now in Andronicus, he's known as Rodan, right? right? Now, whether that's his original name or that's the name that he goes by, but that's the name that he, he's known as. So he's still got the O sound of Apollo, Horus. <laughs> Um, Odin, um, uh, help me out here. Who's the others? Wodan or, you know, Rudra could also be Rodra. Yeah, Rudra, Rudra is close to Rodan, you know. Exactly. Um, and, yeah. and so, and, you know, these are very ancient, um, pronunciations that, can, you know, do change over time. I mean, you just have to listen to modern Hebrew and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, Ashkenazi Hebrew and it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a very different sounds. I'm not familiar with that version, but yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so there's Rodan, all right, or Odin and what, and so can you just, fo- let, let's focus on his path just, just for the moment. Uh, Again, as, as, as I, as I kind of caught on to you, where, where did Odin go? Where did Rodan go? Where, did, where has he, um, manifested in our recent times? Or whatever happened to them? Um, you know, the, he got, well, let me focus on Odin because really he's the only one I know somewhat about and I can't say that I'm a scholar. Um, but he got merged. He got absorbed, I believe, into into uh, Western uh, Christian models. Uh, a lot of the the uh, traditions of, um, you know, even the Odin movement were adopted into Catholicism. I believe um, there is a tradition that says he, in fact, was born on the 25th of December 
Um, so when we celebrate Christmas, we in fact are celebrating um, Odin's Day. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, even in the way we um, name the, the days of the week for, you know, English speakers, Wednesday is Odin's Day. Um, so where did he go? He sort of went dormant into the, the annals of pagan suppression, I suppose. Um, uh, but, you know, he's, again, being a character, he is one of the divinities that interact with us, and he's, he, he reacts to those who know him by the names Odin, and, and also some would say, uh, you know, he's similar to, to uh, Mercury in, in, or Hermes in the Roman or Greek pantheon, and, and some equate those two with the archangel Raphael. Um, so I don't know. Some would say they're in a stretch. He's evolved and, and is still active in some aspects as the Archangel Raphael in today, which, you know, those guys hang around for a long time. It's one of my, those are my favorite people, the Archangels. Yeah. So, I mean, here we have, we, we've got the gods and we've got the Archangels. Um, and well, they say they were gods. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm not always all convinced really. They're just, um, and <sighs> all right. So that's, they, they seem to have been absorbed, as you say, somehow. Right. Um, There's... but how do they man? I mean, yes, they manifest as the energy of Wednesday, right? There's Rodan's day, you know, which is also, and then that, that's, that's kind of, there's also, um, uh, Mercury. Right. Um, so does he become Mercury? Do they become planets? Do they merge into planets or something like that? Or well, I mean, you know, kind of given the name Mercury, because of the characteristic of, of him being the messenger of the God and the planet, I suppose, being the closest to the sun, which in those days when they were naming these things was the sun represented God. Mercury was the, the first hand of the guy who, would go and come. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that he became the planet Mercury. And I, I don't believe that he even is the consciousness of, of Mercury, but, um, uh, you know, but in terms of, um, how he interacts with us on an archetypical level, you know, um, some would say he's a God of war and wisdom. Uh, he also travels frequently in the underworld. Um, you know, what, in what way do we incorporate that into different belief systems? And in, because in, again, these archetypes that filter down through not just the human species, but there are other uh, extraterrestrial and extra-dimensional species that are subject to some of these archetypes. Right? These are universal principles, as far as I can tell. And um, different beings play certain roles. You know, who, who was uh, Anubis? Um, you know, in in the Egyptian tradition and there's a reason I mentioned Anubis because he was the one who would go back and forth between the underworld and was, um, you know, the guardian of Isis, which is the archetypical Mary. And Mary in, in New Age tradition, her counterpart is Raphael. Um, there is even a merger of Anubis and Hermes in, in, uh, some of the literatures. They call them Herm Anubis because they're very similar. So, so, where did they go? They kind of went everywhere. They're pervasive. You know, they, they, that's, that's how I've observed it. They, um, they show up, uh, in ways that, 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 you know, we may not immediately recognize, but I don't know if, I don't know because, you know, it's, it's really us, the human species in our lost state of bewildered forgetfulness that we're trying to grasp onto identity and, and, uh, being able to narrow down um, you know, uh, a consciousness to one narrow band where we can identify it. And, and so I don't believe some of these beings are so intent on, okay, this is me, this is what I do, and only these things. So I guess in a long roundabout way, um, I think they, they, they sort of merge with our reality and wherever we identify them is where they are. They're, they're kind of everywhere, is what I think. That's sort of a wonderful non-answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's say they've, they've faded to gray, you know. Well, I wouldn't say gray. They, yeah. they sort of merged into the, into the, the grand consciousness mm. of the, of who, who interact with the source uh, and pantheons. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm using sort of, uh, 
uh, cinematic, uh, cinematic term, you know, like it's just blending in. Um, right. But how about where they started? I'm always interested in the beginning. You know, um, I'm, I'm interested in where, where humanity started, where everything started going wrong for a start, you know, because obviously things are wrong and, um, things have started going wrong and they started sometime going wrong. So when was that? And is it anything to do with these guys? Well, I mean, or is this, or are these guys a kind of effect? You know, humanity's like, and these guys come along saying, oh, look, hello, little humans. Um, <laughs> and they go, oh, we're looking for our gods. Are you our gods? And they go, oh, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I actually think that is sometimes what happens. Again, they're archetypical. So some of these, some more powerful beings than us and, you know, higher dimension or whatever may come in and they may embody, uh, whether deliberately or opportunistically, some of these archetypes and they're like, yes, we are the God, such and such and such and such, and you will obey us and do what we ask you. And, you know, when you think of that particular God, this is who you should envision. Um, and they are not necessarily that God, you know, they're in the old days, some would, uh, there's a tradition that says Osiris himself was not, uh, or Osiris, the Egyptian God. Um, he was not, uh, a God. He was simply a very powerful Pharaoh who in the, in the tradition of Egyptian and African uh, deification of the the ancestors, he became a god after death. Now, who was the man who some would say became Osiris? And was he Osiris before the archetype, or did he embody the archetype? And the same thing with Horus. So um, then there was a man who was Horus. There was a man who was David, who, you know, in, other, in many ways, some, there's a lot of connection between the... Um, the Celtic god Lu and and uh, the Jewish uh, Hebrew David, very very similar. Um, but are they embodying and are they the beginning or are they representing a holographic manifestation of a principle? Uh, and you know, if you talk about holographic representations, you talk about the Christ lineage, which again is one of my passions. Right? You talk about beings like Horus, Tammuz, um, you know, Jesus, obviously. There are many similarities in these stories, but is it solely because the, you know, the great quote unquote evil Catholic Church munched all these different traditions together? Or is it that the holographic replay happens in these characters' lives over and over and over again? Um, I, I want to make reference to, uh, uh, one of, uh, some of David Wilcox's material where he discovered somebody else found patterns repeating themselves over and over and over again in the Bible. Um, I don't, I think it's psychology was the term he mentioned where things happen in a cycle as we evolve and ascend, we go in a spiral, not in a straight line or a zigzag, but you know, things will happen over and over in everybody's lives. I mean, even in my own life, there are certain patterns that are happening that are, you know, some would look on it and go, wow, you know, there's a distinct Christ pattern there. So, so where do they start? That's, you know, Sometimes they start with a man who becomes a, a, a demigod who then plays a certain role, and that gets added to the overall mythology of some of these characters. So I think. Are we there? Hello? I'm oh, terribly sorry. I just had to go and stock the sto stoke the stove because it, it, I, I have a wood burning stove, um, and I was just making a whole load of noise going, <laughs> and then it was all quiet. And I thought, oh, he's finished his point. <laughs> just a little bit too early. Anyway, so, um, so, so your feeling is that they're that they're kind of they're men who became gods. In some cases, I believe that. Um there are some men who were deified, uh, and, and I don't, and, you know, Asian traditions also deify their ancestors. I believe some of these archetypes were embodied by some men who who were either greater than men or who were just powerful men who who become deities, who then influenced other uh, traditions. And then I also believe that there are some demigods who actually came to Earth and played a certain role. I mean, some of the pharaohs who are both ancestors and demigods, as you know, being the lineage of both uh, Atlantean and, and uh, extraterrestrial, some of these pharaohs, and even those who ascended through their Christing technology, um, could effectively be considered demigod as well as human. Um, 
you know, so, so I think that multiple characters played the same archetype throughout history. That's what I think. And each one contributed their piece to the story. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because there's, there's, there's lots of different stories and they have lots of similarities. And like you say, you know, I'd never heard of the Yoruba story. Um, right. but you know, I, I was aware of the Yoruba tribe. Um, I, I, is it King Sunny Ade is his, is, is his Yoruba? Anyway. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I love African music, by the way, you know, <laughs> and, and reggae and I'm, I'm, I'm always playing, uh, ah. playing, playing our poor listeners, uh, um, the Jar Shaka dub <laughs> and stuff like that. That's my, that's my favorite kind of stuff. Anyhow. That's- uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, I love the sound system and I, you know, I love to stick to my head in the bass bin. Uh, okay, well, I used to. Anyway. <laughs> Back when I was a youth. But, anyway, so, <laughs> so, um, so, what? Go, please go if ahead. I, if, go ahead. No, no, come, please. Well, I mean, personally, you know, my, my overall drive when it comes to these things, um, is a realization that we are, even though we're made of, you know, these 12 strands of DNA on a human, you know, human species, we are really one collectively one people. And the, I think sometimes the focus and the mistake we make, um, on a, on a granular level is to focus on what's different and how mine is better than yours. You know, there is, um, there's more in common than we have in separation. Uh, and if you look at, when you take away the characters, you know, you take away some of the mythologies and some of the, the, the human projected assumptions onto some of these archetypes, you find that the message is sort of universal, you know, and throughout the different movements, you know, there's love your brother as you love yourself and focus on finding your reconnection with divinity. And I mean, that's sort of a very, very rough. Um, okay. Uh, so the, yeah, I yeah. get you. I hear you right now. <laughs> um, and again, my audience are probably bored by this by now, but I'm going to go back to it because it's what well, it's all about, where it all came from. And I I have this this thing that I call the Lyran trauma. Um, and you know, it's something that we we were uh, chatting about. Um, and it's for me, it seems to be the same symptoms as what you're talking about. You know, uh, where humans are easily triggered into distress of separation or even the the threat of it you know the the idea of breaking up your family of losing your your loved ones or your pets is something incredibly distressing indeed and and um in part we were designed to be that way well uh, I, now here's the thing now i believe not that we were designed is that it's um it's an ancient trauma that has been taken advantage of so much in ancient times. It's almost like it's human nature. That's, well, this is my yeah. the, this is my take on it. Uh, so you know, um, feel feel about it, what, however you will. But you know, I agree. I, you know, there's. But then, what does it mean to be human? As a human species in this world, Terra you know, on Earth, we are a combination of multiple characteristics. Um, you know, and yes, that that age old trauma has imprinted on us and that, that old star message, that old star history of the Adam and Eve and the great battle in heaven and the, you know, that's replicated down even into our own Eden, uh, holographic representation is a part of our, our, even the scientists have determined that there's a way to pass on trauma genetically through your epigenetics. Um, so yeah, what do we carry as, as, you know, as a species? Yeah, exactly. A right. So, so I believe the Lyran trauma has definitely played a significant role in how we interact with the rest of the world. And I, I, you're also correct, I think, in that this has been taken advantage of. But in addition to that, it, I believe it's exacerbated by the integration of the reptilian brain and the reptilian genes into, into who we are. You know, the flight or flight, fight or flight mechanism is, is very much a reptilian characteristic, even of the human brain oh, you know, yeah. when it gets triggered. Oh, yeah. Now, is it that we're so powerfully uh, controlled by the fight or flight? Is it, is it by some nefarious design to keep us, as you say, easily triggered or distracted? Or is it on a higher level? Because there's always higher principles that apply. Is it on a higher level an attempt to reconcile the two? 
to be able to use the mammalian compassion and, and, uh, you know, clear, uh, thought and forethought to, to overcome and not necessarily defeat, but to, to, uh, subdue this tendency to go with the fight or flight or the, the, the nasty homicidal rage. Thus, I believe, hmm. I, I believe there was some show, I think it was you who mentioned that, you know, reptilians are very easily triggered into fear because they're constantly in fear of losing their sustenance mm. right uh, and and well i mean threaten a person with the loss of as you said family support supplies and what happens they don't go into sort of a blissful state of manifestation typically unless you're enlightened you go into a state of panic mm. and you want to rip apart your your adversary so wh what are we called to do if we continue to have this internal battle which reflects externally even in the sun is according to Amy Casey. What do we do with this battle? What if we can't rip the brain out and take out the reptilian no. part? No. You know, we not be human. So no. I believe mm -hmm. that personally, I think the path is, is the path of this, they say the middle pillar, right? The, the way of, of, of uh, loving transformation into sort of a Christ consciousness. And I don't mean that in strictly a Christian sense. I mean that in the universal sense of awakening into our, our oneness as a people, as a species, as a, as a universal entity. And that's the struggle. Well, okay. So, let, let, uh, for, for, from my rather, rather basic animalistic side, right, it feels like we have turned each other into mincemeat for the past billion years, ground each other into powder, vaporized, and now we're one big hamburger, right? We're <laughs> a mixture of lyron and reptilian because the reptilians started out eating us. And we have now consumed them. <laughs> we eat chickens. <laughs> they taste like chicken. Anyhow, yeah. um, but the thing is, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, we are a blend now of reptilian and human and higher human and all of this thing. So what they call human nature is not really human nature. And Perhaps we, that one, we, we need to start really kind of being focused about it. I mean, it's, it's part, yes. Okay. So now it's part of our, it is part of our being, but it's not our nature. It's, it's like our burden. What do you think? I think that's a beautiful way to put it. I think well, our human nature, as you know, Simon Parks keeps saying, exactly. is one of innocence, yes. uh, ordering on naivete, but mostly innocence. Yeah. And as we've experienced life in these many thousands of years, at least in this uh, planet, it's been messed around with by, you know, nefarious characters who take advantage of our nature, who know how it works and decide to trigger it in many ways to make us become something that we uh, if, if left, uh, unbidden would not be, you know, if you, you take, uh, you know, you, you know about these, these horrible, uh, mind control things where they do to children, but. Oh, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, the last two hours have been about that. The, the previous show was about an MK survivor. Um, well, there you go. Yeah, uh, so you we, know, we so know. We're, we're, we're there, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the question is having come out of the MK or the, the monarch or whatever the different programs are. Is it the nature of the person to be the way they are, or is it the result of corruption? I think as a species, we have been corrupt, and we've been corrupt, and we're being asked to move beyond uh, where we are, uh, having been corrupted, because I think it's our destiny to not go the path of the warrior of we're going to destroy our enemy. That's been done by, I think, another species who we've been integrated, right? Now we're, we're being asked to integrate all these different characteristics. We're not, you know, in, to move into... Reconcilia reconciliation and, and universal oneness, right? Um, because it, the fight begets a fight. You know, the, the Absolutely. karma. You can't stop fighting. You can't, you just can't stop fighting by fighting it. Precisely. You know, and what here's the thing. You know, mm -hmm. there's another thing that people call disease. And I believe disease is the, is an, is when the fight goes internal. Exactly. And we deny one part of ourselves. And, Indeed. you know, in healing, I'm, you know, I, I do do some some uh, counseling and healing work. Uh, and one of the things that the one of the things it's really about is being heard. 
that it's when these little parts of ourselves that have never been heard get heard, then everybody's all right. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, uh, exactly. It's, it's giving a voice or acknowledging certain parts of ourselves that we would rather not. There's a, um, a similar technique in the shamanic world called uh, soul retrieval. And, and, you know, when, when, when a consciousness is traumatized so severely, sometimes we can break into parts and, and some say our soul, I believe it's just, you know, our consciousness shatters and some parts run off and go hide. And, and um, in order to bring about uh, reconstitution uh, of a whole consciousness, people have to go and fetch these parts. And one of the, a part of the healing process is to hear, to sit and talk to this part and say, Hey, what's your trauma? Why are you here? And offer, uh, you know, reassurance that it's not going to happen again. But uh, a large part of um, he- healing is acknowledgement. Even you know, if I were to stretch this just a little bit um, to go further and to say, even with some of the past life regression stuff, Dolores Cannon does it. Uh, there's another man. There's a number of people do it. Um, Wheel does it. Um, and, and what simply they do is to bring the consciousness to the moment of the event of trauma. And simply by observing the trauma or even acknowledging that, yes, I was traumatized in this way without any other intention or any other kind of effective therapy, simply by observing this trauma in a past life, the patient, the client, the person is often miraculously healed for good. You know, so, so, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm just saying I agree in a long winded way. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, it's happened to billions of people over billions of years or over a billion years. So how or what is the path to heal it in your, you know, for for instance, in your clientele, have you uh, come across anybody who's, who's, um, who's experienced um, a trauma this far back in time? Um, no, I, I've, 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 uh, ex- had clients that, um, experience trauma on multiple levels, um, but not this far back. Now, if I were to, to be so bold as to suggest, I think one of the ways as to answer your question, to move toward healing is first the truth, you know, um, as you know, we're also going through that that uh, time when the truth sayers are coming out and things are being leaked left, right and center in the media that, you know, even a few years ago would have been unheard of. Uh, we must first acknowledge what is, what is reality. And then only then can we know what to do. But, you know, again, if you apply hermetic principles, of, you know, as above, so below, they're multi layers and holographic representation of things. First, we have to reconcile the war within. And once we reconcile the war within, then things externally can either easily be fixed or will fix themselves. I mean, for example, you know, a lot of people here on the planet eat animals. We herd them, we capture them, we, we pen them in, we subject them to horrible torture here in the sort of the American animal factory system. I don't know about the rest of the world, but um, I've chosen to be vegetarian. Now, if we ourselves as human beings eat animals who, you know, are subject to horrible experiences over and over and over again, how do we, in the face of that, petition any greater being and say, hey, we don't want to be eaten or tortured or abused or penned or treated like property when we ourselves do that? So first. That. There we are. OK, many apologies. I don't know when that happened. God, mm. You know, it keeps going on and it keeps going off. And I don't know why. Uh, and. This system is going to be replaced in uh, just about three or four, two or three days once I get back online, once I get some downtime. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So, I mean, Michael, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that one of the things that I do, believe it or not, <clears throat> I, I work, you know, I work a lot with the angels and the archangels. One of the things that I do in my practice is to remove negative entities from uh, both people and sometimes, um, sometimes devices, mm-hmm. perhaps. JP, you should consider uh, doing something for your machinery. Uh, you know? Yeah, um, the gin. You know, um, in um, in India, when they first started seeing steam engines, 
and the magic of these things, they said that there was a jinn inside, and they would point it and say, "Injin, injin," and right. um, and we now call them engines. Yes, very interesting. And the, and well, the, and the engineer was the person, is the ghost whisperer, the, the jinn whisperer. Yeah, it, it's amazing how things in history affect every day, and we don't even realize. But I, you know, again, you're very familiar with the archonic infestation and how they interact with. Uh, uh, electronics. And then there is, um, you know, there's a, an associate of mine. I, I wouldn't call him a friend. I've spoken to him a few times. We hung out a couple of times. A man named Duncan Cameron, who, uh, was a part of the Montauk stuff. And oh, he really? talks, yeah. yeah, he talks at length about, um, certain reptilian type, uh, hybridized beings that are responsible, uh, for the maintenance and the buffering of the third dimension. And sometimes they get corrupted and they infest machines and cause all kinds of havoc. And I say this, it sounds kind of off the wall, woo woo, but, I say this because I've been to a workshop where he discussed this very thing and he demonstrates this in his workshop where he has very high, high quality, high fidelity audio equipment. It's professional studio grade and he brings it into the, 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 the workshop and he demonstrates literally removing some of these little buggers that, you know, they look like little worms, um, out of the machinery and he plays the before and after for the audience and there's definitely a perceptible difference and it happens. I've seen it happen a couple times where you can you can literally hear the music a lot better. And I, I've sat in a room with another person uh, that I, I'm connected to um, um, who we both uh, saw the actual entity as it was being removed. And I know she saw it because she she gasped at the same time I saw it being removed. So I know some of these things are, you know, they're 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 real and they can get in the way. Um, uh, so, you know, maybe something you want to try for either old and new equipment. Yes, well, uh, it, it is a thought that, um, you know, I haven't, uh, besmudged or, uh, or, um, uh, spiritually cleansed. I, I have a gunter, which I do. There's a, a, a Tibetan bell and <laughs> it just breaks everything up. It's like, and it'll, yeah. it's relentless. And they, and, uh, you find it, it gets grindy for a while, you know, it goes, and then it's smooth again. And, uh, that's, that's the, the, the demons getting caught and ground up in them. Um, so yeah. Uh, or it could be just energetic interference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever you want to call them. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, but yes, I mean, e- even in, um, uh, computer programming language, there is a thing called a daemon, which is, a, a an un- right. unattended process. Yes. So you could Tricky say name. things that just sustain themselves elementally are, that's what a daemon is. That's an unattended process. Anyhow, anyhow, so, um, right now, just going to make sure that I'm still online because there's all these things, all these things that are, I'm having to completely be on the ball today, which is a bit strange. Um, and, uh, <laughs> the, the station, like, I, I, I lose, uh, the complete internet for 15 minutes this afternoon for some bizarre reason that it just stops and uh, right. then comes back. So. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there are things that they don't want us to speak about. Oh, wow. Perhaps. We'd, we'd love to have Duncan Cameron on the show, by the way. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I haven't been in touch with him in such a long time. Next time I, I, when I get a chance, I'll reach out to him. I think you guys would actually get along quite well. He's quite a character. He sounds like he's from the forties, you know. He, there's a story. And I'm not sure if it's him. I don't want to actually say it, but I, I, I gotta double check this, but I think he might have been one of the guys who came forward in time, you know, and that's why they grabbed him and used him on the chair. He went to Mars, did all kinds of amazing things. Um, interesting fellow, but he doesn't work well with electronics. He causes all kinds of crazy things to happen, so he's, he's, uh, you know, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, we, we're using, um, an EMF protector called Shungite. Uh, I don't know if ah. you've heard of this stuff. Um, I've been wanting to get some Shungai for some time. Oh, uh, contact Nancy at uh, cosmicreality.net. She'll send you a bag and some all stuff. Alright. Uh, sure. So, uh, yeah, well, I'll send you, send you her address. She's, she's one of the hosts here. And, uh, so, um, yeah, so badass gods all the way down to the, to the trauma. So, yeah, so this, this is, I mean, this is one of my, my kind of pet subjects. Um, and I'd really like to be able to include as many people as possible uh, and make this kind of like an open source therapy. 
you know, that nobody's got an expertise in it. It's just something we all know. Like midwifery. You know, you don't get, like, competitions with the best midwife, do you? They just do. No. They just know what they know. They do what they do. And it's a, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a natural thing. Um, and I, I think that, um, we need a, a vast number of people who are able to perform a process of, to me, it's, it's like, it's like almost like combing hair, you know, combing the knots out of, out of tangled hair. Um, right. And perhaps, you know, like bringing the kids in from, from the, from the wilderness and, uh, scrubbing them up and, uh, having a, a bath and a shower and cleaning them up for the first time is uh, a lot of humans are kind of emotionally like that. Uh, having gone through trauma after trauma after trauma. Um, well, there's a trauma of the past and there's a trauma of ignorance. There's, you know, we really, you know, there's coming a time when, the, 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 as, you know, a lot of people have been saying, the truth will be known and a lot of people are going to go into shock and we're going to need people to triage and say, okay, here's, here's what we know and here's the reality and have a seat there and, you know, have a sip of this, this sherry while we give you the, the true history. And then we're going to have to sort of transition them into, uh, what they thought was reality into the actual reality. I, I, um, yeah, I think that we do need to, to, to have sort of a program where, mm. um, we can affect healing uh, without competitive. I'm better than you, ego. Absolutely, base. absolutely. We, we, it just can't happen. <laughs> we, we, have peop, we have to have real healers who are really healing and being humble about it, and just kind of one after the other. After that. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it, it's um, there's a mission in there that is karmic as well. Um, so. There are things that we learned. We learned how to be warriors and we've now learned how to be healers too. Right. And it's time to, to, uh, to heal everything. And that includes healing the reptilian side. Exactly. You know, it's not, it's not like, uh, and here's the thing is that people have this thing. Oh, we must destroy the ego. We must no. And as you were saying before, St. Michael stands on the dragon. He doesn't kill it. Exactly. He subdues it because the dragon is a part of our universal heritage. The dragon is the, the energy of creation and manifestation. You know? So the, the consciousness that brings things about is the dragon energy. Um, you don't kill it. You, you, you subject it to a higher authority, which is what Michael represents, or Angel Michael represents the will of God. That's, you know, what is, what his mandate is. And, you know, you talk about healing as karma or the karma of healing precisely. Um, and in, in, in the, in true, some of the warrior castes, the, the masters not only learn how to be warriors, but they also learn how to be healers. Um, you know, I, I'm a Kung Fu practitioner and I've studied Qigong as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, you talk about yin and yang, you can't, it's, it's imbalanced to have one without the other. It's also irresponsible. If you're, if you're, if you're given the knowledge of how to destroy somebody, then you should also, or at least not destroy them, you know, sort of severely damage them. You should, I believe, be given the knowledge of how to mitigate some of that damage. And and to that end, I, I have, um, you know, I'm a part of several groups, but a part of my mandate um, given to me by by my, my Hindu Swami teacher, <laughs> he doesn't like to call himself a guru, he calls himself a teacher and a friend, um, which makes him unique amongst many. But one of the mandates, uh, and, and even it being my dharma before I met him, is to effect healing to bring about healing in as many ways as possible to as many people. Um, and to that end, he, he was able to restore many, many ancient, really ancient um, Hindu uh, manuscripts. Uh, they call the palm leaf scrolls that are, were so secret that, you know, many people knew nothing about even the people who were guarding them. Uh, this man incarnated, his name is Sri Kaleshwar. He incarnated, uh, in uh, South India and, and masters would, would come out of the woodwork and present him with this, these different uh, manuscripts that had ancient healing techniques. His mandate was to teach these techniques because, um, you know, this is going to sound a little interesting, but he was a contemporary of Christ, of Jesus in the time of Jesus. And so one of the, the, the agreements he made, one of the commitments he made to Jesus was, was uh, in this time to come back and to spread the teaching of how to heal and how to become the new Christ generation, the new, the new 
uh, wave of healers that will go and, and, and help to transition humanity into uh, this new consciousness where they're aware of how they've been traumatized and, and, and work to heal that. So, yeah, that's uh, part of my dharma. Indeed, where karma becomes dharma, uh-huh. where guru becomes G or you. So, I, I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you were hearing the, at the beginning, but my, my show is, is like, we're going beyond gurus and all this stuff because we have to become, you know, as the war is within, the, the spiritual path is within. The, you know, you could go to the Himalayas, you could, you know, study all these things, you could go to India, you could go all these different pilgrimage. Good idea, you know, doing pilgrimage because that connects you with the land where you were when you last incarnated there. And so you got your, you know, sort of re, 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 restoration package, uh, kind of thing. Um, but, uh, it's best to kind of get to the vibe, get to the vibration of who you are. Exactly. I believe wholeheartedly in that. And then the, again, this is why I like this particular teacher because he doesn't, he's not all about the bow at my feet and give me roses. In fact, when they would give him these reeds, he would take them off and pass them on to other people. He was more interested in teaching. Uh, healing principles so that we would go out instead of staying in the Himalaya, so to speak, or in India, you would go out into the world and bring healing, not necessarily to spread a message, but simply heal the sick, you know, uh, feed the hungry, clothe the poor, you know, in the tradition of Shirdi Sai Baba, uh, which is a lot of what he did. Um, uh, and, and again, this is one of my teachers. He's not the only one, but his message and his technique integrates very well with me. And I, and I feel like there's a, as a karmic dharmic relationship, but yeah, I believe it's time to move beyond at least the traditional guru, where you would you would sit at one person's feet in total devotion to their every word. Um, there was a time when that was necessary, but I don't believe we're we're there now. We have graduated, I think, to a higher level of, of consciousness. Oh, yeah. Where well, you have we, to realize that that's that's you know the external, isn't it? That's that's just the beginning when you see somebody else as potentially spiritual, but. It's when you see your own spirit and express, exactly. express it yourself. Which, and it's really simple because that's what kids do all the time. You know, it's, yeah. it's, this is really hard not to, you know, and as we're beaten and traumatized into adulthood, um, we lose it all, you know, by the time we're 10, then we've forgotten how to be spontaneous and, and happy and all that stuff. And the world is very serious and there's taxes and school and, uh, you know, yeah, buses sure. and violence and guns and, and, uh, and terrorists and ISIS and, you know, and, 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 and it gets worse and worse and worse. And so there comes a point when you have to, somebody's got to say, yeah, stop, stop. I right. want to, I want to get off this kind of spinning, spiraling madness. Most yeah, people. We're yeah. This, uh, well, I was just going to say we're mm. force fed the scarcity model, which is one of the ways they, uh, so we're controlled as a so society. So that's a, that's a reptilian thing, right? Yes. Isn't it? That's one of the, you see, what I'm, what I'm working on. So here's, here's, here's where we, we, our work kind of blends here. What I'm, what I'm coming to the idea is that there are, there are all these different, uh, human races or all these different races that make up the human. Mm-hmm. These, the, the, you know, different, whatever they call 12 strands of DNA or the different, uh, races, but each one of them has their trauma. And that we suffer them all, which is why, you know, the burden of humanity is to carry all of these traumas and to heal them. Perhaps yes. by bringing together these different threads within us, by relating, having relationships with people who are um, Anubian or Arcturian or this or that. Ian. <laughs> Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, each... Into each piece, it carries a part of the whole puzzle. Uh, just like, you know, you've got, uh, like quickly make a reference to the book of Q where, you know, the, the, the synoptic gospels all took pieces of that one puzzle, but there's, there's one doctrine that, that has, that holds the key. Just as, and you know, with, with you saying that these races that make up who we are each have their own trauma, but you know, in the words of one of my teachers, Max Christensen, who created the Quinlan system, um, who's a Taoist, amazing superhuman guy with the rainbow body stuff. He also says each of these races have their own gift. 
And, you know, for example, some, some may be able to have the gift of teleportation. The others have the gift of material, uh, uh, manipulation. And, and we have all of these things along with the trauma. We have all the gifts combined into one, one being, one, one person. And th- I think this is part of the reason reptilians are so key to, to grab our DNA and trade it and keep us locked down. So we don't manifest all these sort of avatar, quote unquote, powers to, 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 uh, become such great beings but if we can leverage the gifts of each of these races to help heal the trauma and then heal each other then where do we where do we go from this there? is this is the point I mean, yes exactly this is exactly the point this is how we evolve through into those things and it's through all right so here's here's my idea or you know why why have i why i understand <laughs> like you kind of fall into these things, you know, something happens during a session and you, you note that, oh, wow, that really worked better than the other way. So you've re- refined your method or that's how I've been working anyway. And so I've, I, it's, 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 it's getting the, to the point now um, where when you, when you basically you reconnect with the, um, with the broken feeling. You see, we, we have a broken feeling with us, within us that is we're unable to feel properly because, um, part of us is stuck <laughs> outside of our body trying to feel it, but we, we prevent ourselves from feeling it by doing this kind of, we, we clench a little fist inside us or go, right. and it's a kind of, I call it hypoxia, the, uh, you know, having not, uh, not enough brain, uh, not enough oxygen. Yeah, this is the, uh, Having not enough oxygen in the brain. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, the, there's a sphincter clenching that happens. Too. Exactly. Different sphincters hold different traumas. <laughs> yeah. Now, when yeah. you, when you get to the release of those things, that's when you discover your superpowers and sensitivities as well. Because sometimes a power, you have a power of, of being able to express, but there's also a kind of receiving power as well that corresponds to it, like a radio transmitter and receiver, or a telepathic indeed, to be able to receive telepathy and to be able to send it. You know, th- those are all, those are all certain stages of our development that we often get traumatized at, and sometimes even ritually traumatized. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, there's, it's all well and good. It's, it, people are traumatized in multiple lifetimes. They carry the, the, the marks of these trauma forward. And so it, it, it tends to influence behaviors as, uh, Simon Parks often refers to the, the person with the button trauma. Um, but, but one must not also forget and ignore that there is a concerted effort to broadcast at, uh, you know, on a wide spectrum and in certain places more than others. Um, uh, certain electromagnetic frequencies specifically designed to keep us at a low level of anxiety. So, so while we're working internally, you know, just like you've got your, uh, you said you have a generator there that negates uh, negative energy. We also have to be mindful of, and not be overcome with paranoia, but also be mindful that there is a reality where forces are aligned against healing. And so it's hard to open up and release, as you say, the, the clenching when upon doing that you're just going to be bombarded by these uh by these uh, negative waves and, and, and um even entities and so on so one needs to have um a a powerful sense of spiritual health where you cleanse clear and protect and be realistic about the fact that there are things to protect yourself from because there are those who believe in love and light and there's no negativity but you know that defeats the whole purpose of duality uh, which is how the world was made right so so protect, cleanse, clear, and then you can open up to, I think, um, greater, deeper healing. Maybe Great. far as a rich. Yeah, so, anyway, Michael, we're, yeah. we're, we're at the top of the hour or just a bit ah. beyond. So let's take a little break so that people can go and um, use the bathroom, as you say in America. And uh, uh, I'll go and uh, put some logs in the fire and uh, keep the house warm. Because it's, it's summer in Scotland, you know, we only use half the amount of logs. That's all. Okay. Anyway, so, uh, th- this is a track, um, uh, it actually, um, I'm playing a, a, the string part of this. There's someone playing a violin and I'm playing the string part. This is called C Forms and, uh, it's Leela Senior who's, uh, playing the violin and Neil. Your music. Yeah. I, oh, wow. I'm playing it myself. Anyway, there you go. This is called C Forms. Awesome.
You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. Yes, you are. Here we are, back again. So, that was uh, Leela Senior and myself, um, well, and, and Neil Sharp, just jamming it. Just, yeah. See, I, when I asked the later, you know, you know, I, I was following you. What were you playing? And she said, I was following you. What were you playing? And that's how it happened. That's how all brilliant stuff happens. It just spun. That's what I mean by spontaneous reality there. So, my guest this afternoon is Michael Graham. And we've been having a very wide ranging, deep and profound, uh, highly connective, highly connected, uh, um, to, to observers on the path kind of conversation. How's your Dharma, my friend? <laughs> my Dharma is well and progressing. I love the music. That was amazing. I, I have a special place in my heart for um, strings and Celtic music in general, especially high mountain Celtic music, part of my my lineage even. But um, yeah, that was beautiful. All right. Well, I mean, Leela really, you know, she is very Scottish, and um, um, she does. She's brilliant. She does all the uh, the uh, Scottish traditional violin. She teaches it, but uh, also composes music for films, and has studied the Eastern traditions as well. So she blends the eastern the middle eastern and all of that stuff and you can hear all those little twiddles in there i heard them from heard all, them. all over the world is just, just a just a, and you know these they just kind of all fell together it was just lovely so how do we get back how do we how we how do we draw it all back let's 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 take the the journey home now we know what's the what the what the truth is the truth is that we've we've been shattered and in return, we shattered that which shattered us, and it's continued, and we've continued shattering ourselves until we're completely fragmented. And as I say, we're we're hamburger, we're you know a blend of all these races who have been at war with each other. You know, we're sort of, yeah, no, I don't. Wanna, it's a it's a horrible thing to think, but you know, we're we're all in this blend together. Now we are, and uh, we've all been put in the big vat and saying, figure it out. And just don't bother us until you have. <laughs> what do you think? Um, you know, there's, um, <laughs> like I said, I work a lot with angels. There was a time when uh, human beings would walk with the angel and, and with perfect connection with our, with our higher selves. And, and um, we would know, as you say, how to figure it out right away. Uh, or we would be told, okay, you're not paying attention here. Uh, this is what, you know, is actually happening and here. <clears throat> here are some options that you might want to consider. Which one would you choose? Um, we have gone through several layers of uh, de-evolution where we've uh, lost a lot of the, you know, and, and some say that's because the, the genes have been uh, removed. All, you know, a lot of the strands have been broken out down to just the, the two. Um, and so uh, the guidance comes in uh, subconsciously. But I believe one of the things we need to do is open up and ask for guidance. Uh, the angelic realms, at least, they work according to the law of free will, and they will not intervene unless <clears throat> we ask them, which is sort of distinctly different from the negative. They sort of jump in and do whatever they want, whenever they want. But we must first become conscious of the fact that we can't do it alone. We're not meant to do it alone. Um, we must ask for help whenever we feel like we need help. And uh, there can be guidance given to help us to make the right choices. Um, I think that's where it all starts. My Where I am now came about because I stopped looking at what I was looking at and I said, I need I need help, I need guidance. There was a time I was really in going down one particular path and I said, huh, I don't like this, I want to go somewhere else. And then I was led into it. I mean, this is a story I'm sure a lot of people talk about. I, I was in Washington, D.C. at the time, and I walked into a bookstore, felt inspired. I walked past several aisles. I walked straight up to um, this one aisle with this one blue book that was glowing, this ethereal glow of, of you know, knowing. And I picked the book up, and it, the book said uh, Interview with an Angel. And that, that was an amazing book that really opened me up to a lot of things. And, you know, it catapulted me in a whole, I wouldn't say a whole new direction, but it acted like a catalyst. So, and things come to you that way. When it comes, jump on it, follow it, and ask for more. That's what I think the, the, an important part of uh, getting us back to where we need to be is. So it's so 
to that end, have you found uh, your work, uh, like I say, is it deepening in some way? Have you, have you, this, <laughs> you know, one of the things, here's a thing. I read a book out, you know, in four people um, uh, called uh, Atlantis, the Dark Continent. And it started out as a hypnotist who was like deprogramming people from tobacco smoking and stuff like that. And then he started regressing them. Um, and then they started telling these stories and then they started saying, yeah, but I remember you. <laughs> and he's like, Oh, right. Oh, I'm part of this. All right. And so, and he discovered that he, uh, turned it out, turned out to be, uh, some really great kind of Machiavellian, um, brain manipulating crystal, you know, uh, crystal manipulator. Um, and so his karma was to, to be the hypnotist who um, helps them deal with all the trauma uh, that they put each other through, that he put them through as well. Okay. So, um, uh, and this is why, you know, this is why I'm saying, you know, that we we've learned how to to kill. We we you know we've shown the reptilians how how to do it properly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> anything that anything that they could do, you know. Basically, you know, my, my feeling is that, you know, the, the reptiles didn't know who they took on. They thought we were just some, you know, docile sheep type people. But we're not, you know, if you, we'll just rise to any occasion, anything, and we'll, we'll just master it. That's, you know, that's why they call us the masters. Cause the, the, there is a, you know, a certain percentage of people who are going to survive any onslaught. And they look, they have mastered it and stayed on top of the whole thing. Right, we're the geniuses when it comes to surviving adversity. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, because we evolve out of it, we evolve out of the problem, and that's how that's that's the clever bit. And it it happens through the action of spontaneous love. There's always some factor of love that has has something to do with the 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 evolving on somehow. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, love is a universal force that 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 uh brings things into into coherence into harmony um into rightedness one might say uh, and some of the spontaneous jumps that we make in evolution are, are as a result of um divine beings who having evolved from where we are reached a hand back and said let me help you come up and they they come as avatars and many avatars of vishnu as you know buddha uh the siddhartha gautama buddha um, and, and Jesus himself, or Yeshua, depending on what you want to call him. And every now and then, as according to the Hindu philosophy, every yuga, there's an avatar that comes to help um, uh, lead mankind towards a path of salvation. And that's sort of the, the Bodhisattva vow, where a lot of us, even incarnated now, um, have taken this Bodhisattva vow, that we are, we are meant to stick around until... Um, the human human being can realize their greater nature of universal love and wisdom, which is sort of the dual nature of divinity, and with that achieve healing and transcend this this what is this you know the wheel of samsara this this karmic cycle of rebirth and move on to to greatness. Um, you know, I I think um, a part of who you know we're all one big consciousness separated, you know, like like fingers on a hand, but we're all attached to the same body, and we're meant to to overcome, you know, every challenge that's thrown at us, we figure out a way to, to integrate, overcome and, and, and expand. Um, and so I think, um, uh, there's the hard way to do it. And then there's the way that's documented and proven and where it says here, this is the best way to do it. And universally over and over and over again, throughout history, it's been said the same thing. As you say, love, love is the way love, is the way and it's not just oh i love you because you've got you know great legs and and uh your eyes are blue but thank you but beyond just <laughs> uh yeah it goes beyond uh what we know is carnal or even uh limited depending uh dependent love it goes into universal unconditional love like uh the the, the radical concept of of loving the reptilian into submission is something that might actually work if it's employed properly. I believe, um, I think Simon Parks even talked about this recently where I reference him a lot because I think it's pretty cool. Um, he, you know, somebody asked him a question, well, how much hallucinogenic drugs does a reptilian have to take in order for them to be overcome with love? 
and what would happen. And, and, you know, he talks about them sort of coming to a standstill and living in shock. And I think that's, you know, again, we talk about hate begets hate, fear begets fear, you know, war just is perpetual. And even when you conquer your enemy, there's always someone who's going to come back and conquer you. Love begets love. And what do you do when you're overwhelmed with love and then there's people coming to love you? What, what I mean, envision that world, you know. You give out as much love as you can, and in return, what does the universe do? It sends you even more. That's bliss. That's heaven, wherever you are. Earth. Yep, yep. Even Idiot. and uh, and you manifest that around you. Precisely. It's, uh, and it gets more and more and more. And uh, you just have to keep holding it up, and then you meet other people, and you make sure that they live close to you. <laughs> you draw them in, yes. and you build it up. That's that. Well, that's that's what well, that's my sort of plan is anyway. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I say love, you love your enemy, you know, it's sort of a, a, a Christian tenet, but not just a Christian tenet. There's all the Buddhist tenets. But, you know, I don't mean um, let them come in and ransack your house and try to hug them. I mean, you know, don't <laughs> you love them, but you don't, you know, what you try to do because the war is within. Right. The The struggle is internal. Do you let yourself harbor hate and negativity and ill will towards someone? Because they've done you wrong. No, you, you're practical. You defend yourself by any means necessary. But at the same time, you don't let this force, this negative force of hate and anger live through you or find expression within you. And I believe it is a force. Just as there's love, the love force, there's the opposite or the lack thereof, which is the, the hate force or the fear force. Don't let it find a purchase. If you find yourself um, experiencing hate and negativity, recognize that it's an, it's a separate force that's trying to find a channel through you, which, you know, the human beings have well been conditioned to channel hate and anger. Um, don't let it sit there. Move it out and choose instead only to experience love. Even if this is an enemy, understand where they are. Okay, they made bad choices. They did stupid things. They're a danger to you and your family. So you're going to avoid them. You're going to defeat them. But you're not going to harbor hate and mal malevolence toward that person because that just taints you and that i think is a transformation um that that we need to go through because once there is no purchase there is no place for, for hate or fear to live within us then it 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 it, it won't exist around us you know the, the, i mean that's an ideal concept but it's just me <laughs> so i think well you know uh on a practical level the way i've i've discovered it is that all i have to do is not react because uh, reptilian actions always create reaction you know that's their they provoke they're provocative you see uh and they make you react by you know pressurizing you in you know mental physical or emotional ways um you know be it intimidation or psychic or whatever uh, and it's our being able to breathe through that and remain neutral and humorous. That is the greatest test. And that's how we love I, them. That's, I mean, you make a very good point because, um, you know, the, the question is, while in your non-reaction, what state are you in? Are you in a that's state love. of love. That's love. Exactly. Well, see, I mean, you know, it's good to say that, but a lot of people may not realize you can choose to be in a state of love, even in your state of non-reaction. Uh, be in love. Be stay stay in that still place, that blissful state of. Wow, there's a uh, emergency vehicles going. Well, I don't know if you can hear it. But, uh, <laughs> stay in love. Stay in love. Even <laughs> even if there are emergency vehicles passing by, just remain in love. Stay in that state. Uh, the different states of samadhi, of bliss and love, which is you know one of the things. One of the differences between the Buddha state and the Bodhisattva state, which is again one of the things that. Uh, my teacher demanded that we not enter the Buddha states because once you get to Buddhahood, you pretty much don't care about anything behind you. You're like, I'm blissed out. I'm totally sitting here in, in my place of uh, non-attachment. And I don't, you know, I see negative, I see positive. It's all good. But the Bodhisattva sees, well, you know, negative oppresses the positive and, and reaches back to try to mitigate while still remaining in that loving place. You know, that's, that's just, I think, you know, that's a good place to be. While non-reacting or reacting. Breathing. Just breathing. breathing. Just being. Yeah. <laughs> Make, remain still even while in action. In yeah. the old days when, um, when Shaolin monks used to, used to do their, uh, you know, their, their, their kung fu practices, when they would move in their different forms, 
as they would perform them or, or practice, they would actually be chanting, <clears throat> excuse me, in some instances, a particular mantra. Aha, here's a thunder acknowledging that. Oh, they my God. <laughs> we've yeah, we've definitely you know, we got a soundtrack tonight. This is really cool. You know, there, there's yeah. Rodan saying hi. Thor and I get along pretty well. He's like a buddy of mine. Um, but, yeah, no, um, an Indra. But, um, yeah, no, so so they, they would actually be chanting a mantra. And sometimes even in the midst of fighting, you know, because these monks, they would have to learn how to fight because they would travel from village to village to bring medicine and food and sometimes money to the people because they're the only ones who would do that. And they would be robbed and attacked and so on. So they learn how to fight. But even in their combat, they would remain in their sense of inner peace. They would be chanting a mantra or reciting a, a meditative uh, phrase while they're externally moving, but internally they're unmoved. You know, so that's I think be a great place to be in in non-reacting, right? Because that creates a field around you that 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 affects everything around you, heart matter or whatever. Yeah, and <laughs> that was going on in, in the background there in New Jersey. Uh, What's happening in New Jersey? Some something uh, you know, just it, is like it, something's just I, exploding. I, well, the sky opened up, and now it's it's crying on my window. And uh, there is now what is this? A second fire truck? If this happens, you know, this, <laughs> this happens. We're just gonna I can mute. Oh wow, wow, wow! So, so I, I can mute from here. <laughs> that's, that's, that's that was close. Anyway, so but you know, let's illustrate exactly what we've been talking about. You know, just keep going through through the different um, potential stimuli that tr- uh, open you into triggering. Now, I came up with a phrase the other night, and I, I, want, I will roll it out here. All right, because um, what we need to be able to be. Is here's the, the the new phrase is the untriggerable empath. How about that? That's awesome. Isn't, I like it. Wouldn't it be cool to be an untriggerable empath, people? You know, just 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 think about that. So this is what we need to this is what we need to be because people with PTSD are just going to pu- push every trigger button that you've got, and you can't treat anybody with PTSD if you've got any PTSD left because they'll push every button you got. Uh, because being, PTSD hates being, it hates being well. It's, cause it's that, you know, that reptilian hamburger. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. The untriggerable empath would probably be best described again. I hate to use, you know, keep beating this one term, but that sounds to me like a bodhisattva to remain loving and yet undisturbed by what you observe. Or, or, you know, divine being, a uh, Christed person, archangel. Well, uh, let, let's just break down, because by this time, it just, it's just a Sanskrit word. So what does Bodhi mean? Ah. Uh, must I, I, must well, be re- related to the Buddha nature, yeah? Yes. They're related yeah. to the Buddha nature. Yeah, yes. bud, like Buddhary, right? Bodhi is Buddhary, you know? Buddhary, like Buddhish or something, you know, to be like a Buddha. Um, you know, I'm feeling very, I'm feeling very Bodhi today, you know? It's like, okay, and then what about Sattva? You, do you know what, what sattva means? And you know, I I did know, and and as is often happen in these cases when you put on the stand, you don't remember. Yeah. Well, look, let's let's. I mean, what what the bodhisattva is is that I will remain here in this dimension until everybody's got off, until we've rescued everybody, and then we'll jump on the boat just as it's leaving. Right. Kind of thing. That's what the bodhisattva thing is, and. um I've, I've often <laughs> played it on the, uh, it's, uh, I, this thing called the, uh, the Chinrezi Puja. Yep. Um, is, it's a, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, people call it different things. Um, what did you say? You said, I probably meant the, the, the pronunciation, but it, it's, uh, it's the Tibetan Kuan Yin. Yeah. Uh, Chinre. and, and the, the, yeah, Chen, it's spelled Chen Re, Chen Rezig. Chen Rezig. Rezig. But uh, I was saying it was Chinrezi or, or, or something like that in, in, uh, in the people that told me. Anyway, so uh, which is basically it's a, a prayer to say, you know, all these people from all this all this karma, all these lifetimes um, have all built up this karma. And, and uh, we're here to help them process. If you if you can recognize these people, you can bring them onto the next stage. Um, and uh, that's the the essence of this. Of, of the the prayer and also of the of the puja it's a it's a kind of multi-purpose thing it's sort of teaching and and dedication at the same time um 
And it's, yeah, and essentially it is, I'm going to, you know, stay here until everybody's better. Um, yep. and I think, I don't, I don't think it's actually very long before that's going to happen. I mean, in terms of great well, global terms. I mean, better is a relative term, right? I mean, once you, once you achieve, uh, a realization of who you are and what you're doing and what we need to heal, then one needs to commence the path of actually healing. And once you've gotten beyond that, there are multiple levels of, of uh, healing to be done going onward and upward. Right? Even those in the fifth dimension have their challenges and the sixth dimension have their challenges. And so you've gotten, you've escaped the dimensionality of reality. There's always healing. There's always better to be come. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's a point where they're going to go, okay, we're good. You're on your own. You can do this. Um, we're off. So <laughs> See you <this>. later. <laughs> Get her on that. You know. Who's that's with us? <laughs> See you later. Who's with us? All right. Yeah. But yeah. Sorry, Michael. I, put, um, I cut you off. Say again? No, I, I, I Say. We're just getting getting the bus out of it. So we we've, we've got a half an hour left. If, if anybody's got any questions, you can uh, chat them in into the chat room. Uh, JP Captain of the ship. Arr, me Jim lad. Um, actually, it did feel a bit like a ship when I inherited the station from Dave. It, it felt like a kind of a boat that had been in the dock being built um, and being um, and uh, you know just like ready to sail, but not actually there yet. So, uh, we're still, it still feels like we're building the crew. Mm. So, tying it all back together, we're looking for a way to, um, not only heal trauma, to go beyond that, to recover our superpowers and our super sensitivities. Because probably, ah, oh, here's the thing, um, Every sensitivity has a power. And so if you've cut off the sensitivity, it was the feeling, you can't use the power anymore. And so when you get the feeling back, you can, you know, it's like being able to put your hand through the, uh, a little glove box that you can do things with, uh, handle radioactive materials and things. Um, so we have all these different, uh, different attributes. Have you... Have you managed to narrow down any of the attributes, uh, these, these qualities, uh, or superpowers? I mean, well, actually, I suppose the Buddhists have done it uh, since time immemorial, would you say? Is that, are we talking about the same thing? You know, well, have, I mean, have the Buddhists figured out the whole 12 strand thing and all that stuff? I, well, the Buddhist, uh, the Tibetan and the Chan and the different Buddhist traditions have uh, figure out how to achieve different states of, of, uh, enlightenment, which activate, um, as you say, superpowers. And so do the Hindu. They, you know, they, there's a lot of, especially in my particular lineage, a lot of focus on the, the divine mother and the fact that she is the one who bestows what's called the siddhis to, to people. You know, they're the yogas that you practice and maintain and nurture over time, which is your own personal power. And then there's the, the great power because the mother is a power in the universe. Um, uh, at least uh, one major power. And so, she bestows the siddhis onto, onto her devotees according to merit. And, you know, one of the things when, when, when uh, doing this work, um, when awakening and moving into a uh, greater awareness of who we are as a people and the potential is to not, I believe, not to be too caught up in, as they say, attaining superpowerhood because the pursuit of power is a fast track to corruption, right? This is sort of, what led to the fall of many powerful people. Um, as, you know, again, biblical reference as seek ye first the kingdom of God and all will be given unto you. If you go after a thing for the power of having it, then to me, that's not necessarily the best intention behind. Oh, no, no. But the, what I'm saying is that the, um, the benefit of going through the process of, of releasing your traumas is that you gain a sensitivity and be a a greater degree of, of uh, being able to manipulate the universe. Absolutely. And, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Absolutely. Which is kind and, of, more, and more responsibility to be a human. Even, yes. And so, so 
one, you know, um, uh, yes, when you uh, heal yourself, you reconnect and, and your, your, your inheritance, your natural state of being is, in fact, a powerful person. Uh, a, a very, and, you know, one must learn to wield the power uh, and wield it rightly. You know, uh, um, one of the things that, that you know, I'm going to try to tie to seemingly different things, but one of the things I've noticed um, about the technological evolution of humanity as we have it right now is, is an attempt, I think, on an energetic level to have power without the spiritual maturity to wield it. Because some of the things that these transhumanist movements and, and uh, these technological um, uh, cloning or, or life extension techniques are are aiming at are the very things that we as as an enlightened or a species or we as a, even even slightly more enlightened. It didn't have to be like a Buddha, but you know you just have to activate even a little bit more. You can do naturally, but but the way they're trying to do it is to do it without the burden of maturing spiritually, which is sort of um, antithetical to, I think, the, the way things should happen naturally. You know, if you give a child uh, a machine gun and you don't teach him how to use it, then you have a potential for chaos. So um, I'm very weary about um, how, you know, we're, we're more and more able to do these amazing things without the, I'd say, spiritual maturity to know how and when and where to employ it. And, and so, yeah, healing first, I think, and then as the, the abilities unlock, for sure, use them and use them in, in massive ways that can transform on, on a, a, a divine scale where we are and what we're doing and, and be the change that uh, <laughs> we want to be, or we've been trying to become. Yeah, I think. Well, uh, I'm just uh, hashtagging here on TalkStream Live, hashtag transform to divinity. There we go. <laughs> yeah. I, so, um, so yeah, we've got about twenty minutes left, and so very interesting conversation. Um, and okay. it's it's really good to, um, like I say, I like to ca- gather perspectives, what um, what people are doing, and how they're. And it's really how people approach this whole thing. You know, the, like you say, you know that there are. There have been people have been approaching this thing for a long, long time, um, but a lot of it is in like foreign languages and in Sanskrit and in you know um, ancient Turkish, you know manuscripts, <laughs> uh, you know uh, all that stuff, Babylonian <laughs> runes, yeah. you know, yeah. and there's yeah. all this stuff and it's all there, um, right. but we haven't got the words for it today. And we need the words for it in order to express what the feeling is. I think it's all about feelings. Okay. And um, how you move from one state to another is through the feeling. And uh, <laughs> because feelings transcend time and space. They're in- right. instantaneous. And, um, well, yeah, that's, that's how I get back there, is uh, take people on that journey. Is to go back through the feeling. It's interesting. Yeah, the feeling. You know, you're right. It does transcend even the cloak, uh, the illusion of separation. The feeling uh, is very in tune with the heart, and the heart is that that vortex that goes directly to uh, the portal, as I said, that goes directly to the source of divinity, right? Um, and, and so, so you know, the feeling. If we can name the feeling, and and acknowledge and heal the feeling and then you know according to uh, greg Braden, when his he talks about uh, um controlling the feeling when you combine uh thought and feeling together then you create reality right and this is when you can have a coherence of thought intention and feeling you can create amazing things so this is this is one of the key reasons i think we need to heal the trauma because, you know, even in our tradition, and I say our tradition, I'm talking about the Hindu tradition that I'm a part of, there is, um, you know, the, unless you can clean um, that, that pit of manifestation, you're going to create uh, chaos, a tainted outcome, um, you know, uh, things that, that um, are, are just as traumatized as you are in your own life. And that's part of the journey as well. 
you know, you find people who are more traumatized than you, you bring them back a little bit. And then you have to go and, and figure out, wow, I, I actually was more traumatized than this. And, and you, you find you go deeper and deeper and deeper and you, <laughs> it, it goes, and, and then you can go back to that same, same client and, and take them to the next level. And then you have to, you know, it, it's like kind of right. climbing up a chimney. Exactly. And, you know, one of the amazing things that like I said in my work, I do, uh, I work with clients in different ways, but one of the amazing things, uh, and I have a number of colleagues who this has happened to, um, as soon as I myself have reconciled a particular trauma, I realize, oh my God, I'm traumatized in this particular way, or I, I carry this burden or this, this wound. And I go through a process and I make a concerted effort to heal myself or at least reduce the effect of the trauma. As soon as I'm done with that, I will find that there are a stream of clients that come that have exactly this problem that, you know, they, they, they call me, they email, they say, I have this problem in my mind. I'm thinking I just got through going through, uh, you know, a process of healing for this type of thing. And so, so in a way, yeah, I think, you know, heal yourself first, heal or heal thyself, sort of the Chiron wound, right? And then having transcended that limitation, we can offer our own enlightened perspective to, to more people and bring them to, you know, at least as far as we've gotten, maybe even further with the assistance of divinity. Um, you know, but that, that's the beautiful part of healing and offering healing because necess- uh, necessarily you also uh, get to heal yourself. Yeah. And th- th- it's, it's like one of those nice things where, you know, what, instead of uh, it being you suffer and everybody gets better is right. you get better and everybody else gets better. And then because everybody else is better, you get a bit better and then you can bring everybody else up. You know, it keeps turning around that spiral again. As, as soon as we don't have to keep, and here's the thing. Imagine what the world would be if we didn't have uh, any debts to pay tomorrow. You know, ah. you didn't have to worry about your mortgage because it's, you know, it's all been paid off. Uh, you didn't have to worry about any car loans. That car outside is yours. How would that right. feel? What would you feel like if that were the way? And then live that way. Despite yeah. the fact that you think you've got debts because then the debts might transform somehow. I think a lot of people would live their passion and they would find that their passion fits perfectly into a system where if everyone is living their passion, there is no competition, there is harmony. And then we will find a greater purpose for the collective humanity, or at least the greater purpose for society. When everyone is living, you know, impassioned, aligned with their highest good, um, then those are the steps that bring forth, you know, heaven on earth. I think, honestly, until you, you know, move on to another passion and, and another one, and then you transcend, you might even um, <clears throat> find that uh, beings outside of your own existence are so attracted to the bliss and joy and productivity that they want to contribute to it just for the nature of, just for the purpose of living their own passion. How do you contribute to even the galactic uh, destiny? Like, you know, it's a, it's a dream. It's a wonderful vision to hold and try to manifest one one day at a time, one person at a time, one decision at a time. I tell you, I really want to play my electric guitar before the Galactic Council. Check out what they do on Earth. Check this thing out. <laughs> I want to... Jesus, man, he's going to play bass. <laughs> Jesus on bass. <laughs> Buddha. <laughs> yeah, Buddha on the drums. Anyway. Exactly. <laughs> Buddha on a stick. So, oh, well, brilliant. Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's a bit of a, see, we have to, we have to break out of the, um, of this kind of fake reverence that everybody's, oh, you must speak ill. You know, these are living character entities and they don't, you know, they laugh a lot. These, these divine beings, they laugh a lot. Um, and. DP, get out of my head. I was just about to tell you. <laughs> Come on, tell me. I was just about to tell you that you talk about the reverence and the fact that we need to, you know, I mean, a lot of the, I, I'm, I'm most versed with Christianity. And so I, I make reference to it a lot. Um, and a lot of the teachings, uh, through the traditional church is one of been somber oppression and guilt ridden, you know, reverence, as you said. But we don't, we, 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 we are not aware of the fact that, you know, these, these people were people and they lived human lives. And, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that even conceptually, though I knew this, 
Jesus was a man or Yeshua was a man. And, uh, and well, his story is really a collection of several people, but the actual Yeshua that came to do stuff, he was a guy, a dude, I like to say. Um, and he had, you know, human characteristics. And one day I saw an image that, like I said, conceptually it made sense. And I, I thought I knew it all along, but having seen it, I realized that, wow, it triggered something. And this is the image of the laughing Christ. It's actually a book that was written. I can't remember the name, but there's a book written by a, a lady called The Laughing Christ or The Laughing Jesus. And just the image of seeing Jesus laughing or Yeshua laughing triggered some and healed a lot of stuff that goes way back. Because, of course, you only see him on the cross. There's a, uh, 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 what is it, a crown of thorns. He's bleeding. It's very sort of, you know, sadistic. Um, but yeah, he laughed, he drank wine, he partied, you know, had kids too, apparently. So I think that makes him much more, uh, approachable, identifiable. Well, you know, we've, we've been, um, beaten with sticks for 2000 years to say Jesus wasn't like us, but <laughs> really, um, it's just that we, you know, we're like Jesus. They weren't like Jesus, but we're like Jesus. <laughs> you know, the Romans, they weren't like Jesus. They weren't not at all not like, they were completely not like Jesus, but like everybody else is kind of a lot more like, you know, na- real native people are really more like Jesus. You know, like, and he's just saying, you know, just be, as, as, as the Germans say, be a man, you know, be a good, be a man, be a good man or be a good woman or be, you know, um, actually, <laughs> the story is to be harmless, isn't it? Is to, um, if there is, if there's disharmony, to bring harmony. Um, and, uh, if there's, uh, if there's a war, to stop the war, not to start, ne- never start a war. Right. And, uh, and if there's, there's pain, there's healing. You know, you just serve the moment as you go. And they, these are the, these are the Bodhisattva warriors, as you call them, or the warriors <laughs> of Shambhala, or the, um, uh, what did I call them? Uh, untriggerable empath. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> the archangelic doctrine. That's right. Yeah. Say that again. The arc. The archangelic doctrine. The archangelic doctrine. Ah, wow. Sounds, that sounds like a book. <laughs> it sounds like a, several volumes. Uh, yeah. Volume one. <laughs> it's 14 inches thick. <laughs> so, um, where would where would you like to take this? Uh, I, I mean, are you looking? Uh, do, do you need more clients? You know, uh, are you are you looking for more uh, challenges in your healing? What do you what, what are you learning for yourself at this moment? Wow, uh, constantly learning. There, there are different uh, processes that I go through that are, are meant to uh, purify my, my blocks and help me to see more of. Uh, where some of my back doors are and, you know, I face on a daily basis, even my own triggers uh, that I have to apply higher principles to, you know, things, things get to me, they piss me off and I, I have to catch myself being, you know, uh, ignorantly human and try to, to live the better life and make better choices. In terms of my clientele, you know, I, um, you know, it's basic. I work with, with angels. I, I get people to, to connect with their guides. I, I walk them through a process of saying, okay, Here's the angel that's next to you. This is the archangel that you're connected to. This is a message that they have for you. And here's how you can connect with them on a more profound, uh, direct basis. And yeah, you don't need me. Go off, do your thing, you know, because I don't necessarily need people to keep coming back over and over again. Like my goal is to get people to a place where they're able to sort of do it on their own. That'll help as much uh, as possible. That's what but, I was waiting for. Exactly. That is exactly the right, to me, that's exactly the right attitude. You, you're not looking for clients. Like the pharma industry, you're looking right. to heal people and like <laughs> keep keep moving, keep moving. You know, there's a lot more people coming your way. Exactly, and there are people that come back because yeah. you know they, they they trust me. They we have a relationship, and and um, some things require multiple sessions to heal. Like I said, I do negative entity removal, and so sometimes it takes a while. Um, but you know, I tend to you know I have a website. I don't advertise it. All of my clients are word of mouth, and you know, if you look on any profile, you won't find me. It's I I depend on the universe to to bring me who they need to bring me at exactly the right time, you know. Um, 
in exactly the right volume. I don't do this full time, even though it is my dharma. I do it um, mostly outside when I'm not, you know, I haven't got a full time job working in corporate America, but most of my time dedicated to this type of thing outside of that. So um, do I want to see more clients? Yes, but only if I can help them. I want to, you know, I want to see humanity healed. That's what I want to see. I want to see people uh, awaken to, to the reality of, of, of the greater nature and, and to whatever extent I can, I can help. I'm, I'm glad to do it. Um, whether through clientele or radio shows or whatever, you know, um, I would love to see people come together to offer, uh, you know, each person has their own gift, their own speciality. I'd love to see people, a uh, group come together to offer uh, healing to people, you know, counseling to people. I, I can do healings. I've studied several healing modalities and I've got this, you know, thing that, that I developed on my own, um, the different types of healing, but I'm not a counselor. I don't, I don't necessarily want to be a counselor. So I envision a group where, you know, okay, I've done my part. You go off to, uh, that person there who's really good at counseling because you need some counseling. And then uh, when you're done, you need to learn how to do energy healing. So because you're gifted in that way. So go to that person. And we're all in the group. I'd love to see that happen. That's sort of a global vision that I want to, you know. Yeah. Do you know what? I've had the, a similar vision, a vision, religion, because it's a, <laughs> it's a village, right? Or a little right. micro village, maybe like half a dozen houses, maybe a dozen people or so. Um, and one of the houses is empty. And people can come and they stay there. And each of the different houses, even the different, um, uh, you know, uh, houses in the cluster is a healing room of some kind, which works on different levels. You know, some may be body healers, you know, do massage and, and, uh, physical therapies and things like that. Um, and others may be more spiritual, uh, alignment or emotional alignment or, you know, different parts. Um, and, and so basically whatever somebody needs, they can receive from any of these people in the village. And the village is a kind of self-sustaining, um, uh, eco, uh, you know, it's, it's self-sustaining. It generates its own energy and, uh, lives, it, yeah, it's off the grid. It's in a forest. It's half underground. You know, the whole thing. Yeah. Everybody wants to live there. We all want to go there. You know, this is called That's very much a vision I've had. I even researched several technologies to, yeah. to uh, sustain an off the grid, uh, village to that extent. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, think, you know, this, this is, this is what the, <laughs> look, <laughs> have you not fig- figured it out by now? This is the Bodhisattva's way, right? This is what we're here to do. This is what we're doing on the planet. You know, now you, now you see other people doing this. It's, a, there's a pattern, you know, and this is, and we're all, uh, we're all being fed by the Buddha and, um, you know, we are being led to different discoveries and all of these things. Um, it's marvelous. I think it's a marvelous thing. Yeah. There are those who are led by Buddha. There are those who are led by uh, Shiva. You know, those who are led by uh, uh, Yeshua and, and, uh, and so on. So, but they're all working for the same group. You know, even though here the the factions, and even uh, Muhammad, you know, an enlightened being, the, the factions argue and bicker amongst themselves and commit horrible atrocities because we accept not only the, the positive aspects of, of these energies, but we we pull in and and, and integrate with the negative aspects. And so. Um, down here we fight and bicker and try to prove who's better, but up there they're, they're, you know, in perfect harmony and they're working all for the same, I believe, for the same purpose in their own way. You know, like I said, Buddha is on drum, Jesus is on bass, but it's all part of the same band, right? That's right. And they make a hell of a bracket. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is excellent. So, um, now, all right. So, how would um, if people uh, did uh, want to uh, connect with you for some reason, uh, mm-hmm. as perhaps aforementioned, you know, people could, yeah. you know, because people people hear different frequencies in different people's voices, which nourish them, you know. So, uh, people, if you've been nourished by Michael's frequencies tonight. Um, I, I, you know, I'll put you in touch. It, it's okay. You know, get in touch by Skype and, uh, I'll put you in touch with Michael. Is that all right then? Does that work? Perfect. Okay. I'll just, I'll just give them your website and it's got a contact form and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be. Good. Yes. Okay. Website is uh, michaelsrighthand.com. 
Oh, well, there you go. It's on the show. Michaelsrighthand.com. Right. There you go. Good, 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 good. So, thank you very much, Michael Graham. It's been a very interesting conversation. You know, as I said, it's, it's jazz. Um, with, uh, with, uh, uh, we, we start off with something familiar. We come back to something familiar. Um, as a, as a kind of outgoing message, what would you, you know, you've got, you know, about three or four minutes. Would you like to, uh, to, uh, fill that time with whatever you want, whatever you want, whatever you want to say? Well, well, um, I, first of all, I want to thank you, JP, uh, for having me on your show. This is, um, uh, an amazing opportunity and I, I'm a fan of your, your work. I've listened to a number of, <clears throat> a number of your shows and I enjoy your, your interview, uh, uh, you know, skills and you're a great host. And uh, so I appreciate taking the time to <clears throat> talk to me and, and getting me to, uh, I guess put, put my voice out there. Um, to, 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 if I were to, I mean, you know, my belief, I don't know. Some people may call me, uh, uh, my ex-wife says I'm, I'm, I'm incorrigibly optimistic when it comes to people, <laughs> uh, give people the benefit of the doubt. But I truly believe that in spite of what we're being told in the media, in spite of what we're, we're, we're shown over and over and over again, that somehow we're our, a worthless people and, and worthy to be damned and destroyed because we're destroying our environment. We, we're horrible to each other. The greater truth is a truth that is not being revealed, that we are, in fact, given opportunity after opportunity, good people with beautiful hearts that really want to experience and give love in, in as many ways as possible. And if not for trauma and for, for a concerted effort to generate a certain level of negativity within us, I believe that you know, we as a, as a people, um, are far more angelic and divine than we are, uh, some would say negative and evil. And, and I just encourage people to don't lose faith in humanity because that's a part of the struggle. That's what the negative elite wants you to believe. They want you to believe that humanity is not worth saving and thereby giving up on all of us. And I say, don't give up. Believe, have faith in humanity. You know, I'm on Facebook and I constantly post, uh, different examples of, of, uh, people doing great things. And it doesn't take much to look around, but you won't find it in mass media, at least hardly so. But, you know, look around with your, your, your fellow human beings and, and believe in the heart of humanity. You know, we're, we are descended from the gods and there's a reason, uh, there's a reason for that. We are, we are truly divine at heart. So give, give love a chance, one love, <laughs> you know, and the inevitable words of uh, Robert Nesta Marley, which is from my homeland, you know, one love, one heart. That's my belief. That's what I'd like to say. And with that, Michael Graham, thank you very much and good night. Good night. This has been Ever Beyond. Beyond, beyond.